Yeah, I started recording. Okay. So watch what you say now from here on. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Let me share. <laughs> There's a line from uh, Mark Twain where he says, sometimes profanity gives at least m as much relief as prayer. <laughs> Sometimes they're combined, like the word, oh, oh, yes, right? Yeah, yeah. Are you able to see Yeah. So you want me to read this, Steph? Yeah, but it, it probably needs to be a little bit larger if you can. I'll see the whole thing, just part of it. Oh, good. There you go. Uh, okay. Dear folks of Baba, as you know, I've invited suggestions for topics recently. And surprisingly, this past week, Three of you suggested the same topic, the role of our pets in this life with Baba. Even though I hadn't had a pet since childhood, I have observed how intimately pets have entered into the adult life of many Baba lovers and their children. The love they have for their dear pets and the very touching love their pets have for them is something precious to behold. Mara once wrote, animals have played a special role in our life with Baba, not only as his pets, receiving his personal touch and contact, but also, it seems, as a channel of his work, reaching out to all the animal world and the whole of creation. He is the perfect caretaker of all animals, big and small, beautiful and ugly. He shared with us his sweet love of nature and all forms of life. I was surprised on my first trip to India to see beside Baba's tomb in the graves of his close woman, Manali, a nearby place devoted to the gravestones of Baba's own dogs that he loved so dearly. There are, are numerous stories of Baba with his many pets, ranging from monkeys to peacocks to the white horse that had belonged to Mara as a child. At the tombs of other masters or saints, I have not witnessed the graves of their pets. <clears throat> In my early trips to Maribad, Naju Kutwal, the daughter of Baba's night watchman, used to give several of us a tour of the large stonewall compound of Upper Maribad where the Eastern and Western women stayed during the late 1930s through the 40s. Naju lived among the women as a child. She would show us where all the different stalls had been, where the wide variety of animals were kept. It was a veritable zoo. Baba's work with animals was not covered in detail in most of the biographies of him. Among his animals, there were deer, goats, English bulls, monkeys, parrots, minor birds, horses, a donkey, a mongoose, a pet snake, and a wide variety of dogs. Erich, Baba's close disciple, once said out of the blue in Monody Hall, you Americans need to go back to your roots. Someone piped up, you mean our Judeo-Christian roots? No, Erich replied, the American Indian. I took this to mean that Christianity and Judaism, as, they come, as they've come down to us through the centuries, primarily emphasize our treatment of other people and not of the other kingdoms. The American Indian has been taught a prof profound reverence for all living beings as well as for the inanimate world. Just as Baba loved the company of all his pets, the lives of so many Baba lovers are enlivened by the presence of their pets. Dogs, cats, gerbils, hamsters, rabbits, no, no. goldfish, koi, birds, and many more. The loving devotion to pets is one of the most precious experiences <laughs> in a recipient of. How have your pets entered into your life with Baba? Are there any experiences from your childhood with pets that were part of the growth of your love? For those of you who have pets now, what role do they play in, in your life? What places do they fill in your heart? Many Baba lovers drew great comfort from the company of their dear pets during the isolation of the pandemic. How have you managed over the years to recover from the loss of these intimate companions? In his love, Jeff. I, yeah, but, yeah, go ahead. <clears throat> I have a story. I start yeah. Off. So... Back in the 70s, I was living in uh, Wilmington, Delaware with my wife at the time, and we had found this stray dog. Uh, um, part Ooh, just a second, I think uh, Mahmoud and uh, Nasreen are echoing in there. Keep going, yeah. So, um, Slow down a little bit, slow down. Okay. Um, so this uh, stray dog came into our possession that we fell in love with. And um, she was part, Weim from what I could guess, part Weimaraner and part Greyhound, very sleek, uh, 
grayish dun color, beautiful dog, fast. I mean, she could go like 30 miles an hour, but she was, um, she must have been abandoned. She was very, I mean, <clears throat> Uh, so uh, loving that she didn't like to be left alone. She was so loving and so grateful to have owners. I mean, just all heart, like 2,000% heart. And um, but, what, but what we found out, we were both working, is that she did not, um, she couldn't handle being left alone during the day when we went off to work. Um, just her an, an, an abandonment, fear, and anxiety. Um, she must have been mistreated. So I tried every possible way to try to comfort her or get her to settle down. She was she would get so upset sometimes she would nearly she she nearly chewed through the front door and it was wood trying to get out. <laughs> um, <laughs> so this went on for months. I just finally gave up. I said I don't know what to do. So I reluct we reluctantly found um, someone to adopt her, and uh, this person lived I think in I think it was in Southern Maryland. So good, 100, 100 miles away at least. And so uh, the person came okay. Person came on a Saturday morning, very nice, very nice uh, couple. And uh, they took faith and uh, I'll never forget the expression on her look as she drove off, how can you do this to me? Uh, um, so, and they said they had a nice property out of the country. So on Sunday, the next day, Sunday morning, I'm underneath my car, I was gonna change the oil, which you could do back in those days. And suddenly I hear, here comes Faith, uh, running under the car, jumping on me, licking my face. It's like, what? And um, <clears throat> so the owner, the new owners, the new people we gave it to uh, called us and told us that they had, they had stopped at a, uh, a gas station on I-95 uh, in Maryland. And uh, she had jumped out of the car on I-95. And this was a good 65 miles from home. Wow. And, and headed north on I-95, I guess, I assume. And th the amazing thing is um, she had to cross the Susquehanna River. I don't know if you ever have come up 95. There's a big, long, there's a long bridge over the Susquehanna River. And that river is about at least half a mile wide. And there's no, uh, later when I drove over, I noticed there's no um, pedestrian walkways on that bridge. It's just, it's this highway right up to the rail. So she either had to, she either went across that bridge and somehow survived it, I don't know how, or, or else she swam the river and got across, uh, so one or the other. <laughs> and then it's a long haul from, from that bridge up, up into Delaware, all the way up 95 to Wilmington. And then, and then, and then coming through Wilmington into our neighborhood and finding you know, our house, and then coming out of the car. I mean, it was incredible. And she did it in a day, and uh, I was, you know, I was so touched by that. I couldn't give her away. We we got another dog to keep her company. Uh, but oh, but good. that was that was so moving. Just the just the the amount of loyalty and to me to us that was so so touching. I was just what humans could would would do that, you know, it's just uh, that their heart, her heart is bigger than mine was, and just uh, was a, just a good les lesson in love, it's basically love, yeah, so, uh, and, and, our, and we had named her appropriately, her name was Faith, you know, we had called her Faith, so uh, she had the faith, that's for sure. <laughs> Beautiful, yeah, I mean, Rich Sander might go, you know, five miles out of his way, but not 65. <laughs> no. <laughs> Beautiful. I know it's incredible. I've, I've had the same experience with our dog, you know, that's how could they possibly have found their way? They got like a, a hidden GPS or something. Yeah. <clears throat> but, <clears throat> you know, I just wanted to mention um, that, you know, in looking at the Baba's previous advents, there's hardly anything written about uh, animals, let alone his work with animals like he did up there on Upper Maribad. I mean, I, I, you don't find that in the life of Jesus or Muhammad or Buddha. That, I mean, there might be, but uh, it seemed like, uh, <clears throat> you know, he was, this was a particular work that he uh, did in this lifetime. And I remember Darwin Shaw who telling me that, you know, back in the 70s and 80s, he found that dogs 
were more aware in the 70s and 80s than than the dogs in his childhood. So that is probably a manifestation of the work that Baba had done up there on the hill. Uh, <clears throat> but um, yeah, like you say, that for some kids, even growing up in dysfunctional families, sometimes it's it's that that's their companion, it's their uh, an experience of unconditional love that their parents that their pets give them and. And that's Baba's way of uh, sneaking into our heart by hook or crook, you might say. Um, but anyway, um, <clears throat> hey, let's Jeff? see. Anybody want to share? Oh, we got. Jeff, I, can I just uh, just yeah. ask one question about your comment about in Jesus's time, he didn't uh, ha either have pets or, or talk about pets. But maybe maybe people in those days, uh, most people didn't didn't uh, keep pets they had animals that they you know maybe through their yeah their farming <clears throat> things but i don't know that they necessarily uh maybe some really rich people had pets I yeah yeah i yeah but this was like uh, there in the upper Maribot, I mean, a specific work he had like i was amazed at the amount of animals baba had up there on the hill well Tony. Yeah, I, I was um, I, um, enjoying um, Joe's story. Uh, reminded me of one of our dogs, I guess our first dog that, that Zeke and I had together. Um, she really didn't want to get a dog. But my daughter Clara and I were kind of really wanted to. And so we finally agreed, that she finally agreed that we could go to the um, North Shore Animal League shelter uh, on the condition that we weren't going to adopt the dog. Uh, we were just going to look at them. And I thought, well, that's fine. Okay. <laughs> so we got there and, you know, there were interesting dogs, but none really spoke to us until we saw this one that really did. Someone was walking him and then they didn't adopt him. But he caught Zeke's attention because he clearly, she recognized this, I wouldn't have. He clearly was show trained and he was a really disciplined dog. And so she said, let me take him. And she started, and she has some experience with this. And she did all the different moves and he knew when to stop, when to start, when to sit, when to, you know, all these different things. And um, so suddenly now Zeke was willing to consider adopting this dog, which we had all fallen in love with already. And we did, he was a Keyshawn. And um, I asked, um, and the chat, if Joe's dog that he was talking about was a Keyshawn, because it's a trait of theirs that they become extremely attached to their owners. And and it's a it's serious business <laughs> if you have a Keyshawn. And so we brought him home, and um, but Zeke did not want the dog to sleep in the bed. You know, people have their dog sleep in the bed. She did not want the dog sleeping in the bed. So we would go to bed and <clears throat> shut the door. And we'd wake up the next morning and there was dog poop um, right outside the door. <laughs> and this went on night after night. And um, we loved the dog, but we this we could not do, you know, deal with. And if we'd go out, uh, I kind of like hook him to the, to the doorknob through his leash, a long leash so he had room to move around. Well, he would scratch the door. And so one time we took him out and we put him in the bathroom in the basement and he had room in the basement but he was the door was shut and we got back and the door was all scraped down and it was we didn't know what to do and finally i said baba what especially with the poops outside the door oh by the way i named him under a little bit of protest but i kind of got the go ahead sort of i named him baba <laughs> And so anytime you called him, you were calling Baba, Baba, come here, Baba, Baba, what did you, <laughs> or, or Baba shit on the floor, <laughs> you know, whatever it was, it was, it was clearly Baba in everything, you know, um, but in the beginning, this was this problem with him outside the door. And I, I said, Baba, internally, I said, Baba, we, we love this dog. We don't want to get rid of him, but we can't have him, you know, doing this. And I clearly got the answer that. He just loves you. He wants to be with you. 
leave the door open, he'll be fine. <laughs> and I went, okay, and I told Zeke, and she went, okay. And we left the door open, he was fine, <laughs> as long as he could be with us. Um, he was um, a little jittery at times in a, when there was a storm. And I had inadvertently, a friend who was studying Reiki, asked me if I wanted a, who would watch Elena, my the stepdaughter, my other daughter. And um, we'd go to pick up Elena and she'd say, would you like a Reiki initiation? And I thought that was the same as a treatment. Well, no, it was getting initiated to do Reiki. And so Zeke wound up being initiated to the second level. I was initiated to the third. Zeke used it in her massage practice. I didn't use it much, except when Erica would freak out during a thunderstorm. And I would just reach, he'd be at the side of the bed and I'd reach over and lay, put my hand down and give him Reiki. And as long as he was getting Reiki, he was fine. Um, the only other story I guess that pops into mind is um, he got sick. He eventually got sick. He had, um, was it kidney something? It was something very typical for um, Keyshawn's. Um, and he was dying and he kind of knew it. And he was, he was easy going about it. And he was, um, he was just lying down and he wasn't eating, he wasn't drinking, but he was lingering. And we didn't know what to do, how we could help him or what. And we had a friend, Zeke and I had studied for two years in an interfaith seminary to be interfaith ministers, beads on one string kind of thing. And one of our classmates was uh, kind of a dog whisperer. So a psychic, and we thought, and she knew, we knew she was having money, so we, we called and asked if she could help us out with Erico. And she said, he's just, he doesn't want to leave you. You need to give him permission to go. She said, he's waiting for someone. And when that person comes, and if they, if they give him, if you all give him permission, he'll go, but he won't leave otherwise. Well, my daughter, Clara, we had joint custody with my ex-wife. They just lived around the corner, but it was like one week with me, one week with her mother, since she was three. And it was um, her mother's week. So Friday came, Clara came over. I told her the situation. She loves pets. She loves pets. She works as a vet tech now. Um, and she just put it, and, and uh, Keyshawn's a kind of barrel chested dogs. And she just put her hands on his big barrel chest. And she said, it's all right. Just go to sleep. Just go to sleep. It's okay, uh, Baba. She might have not have said Baba, but she said, just go to sleep. And I thought, duh, we were telling him, you can go, you can go now, but go where? <laughs> the instant she came in, she knew to say, go to sleep. She went to bed to get up early for work. We all went to bed. When she got up, Baba had gone. Um, he was just waiting for that. Um, so yeah. And we love that dog so much. We love this guy we have now, but it's a whole different relationship. And I'll, I'll just stick on one dog per intervention. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Thanks, Tony. Yeah. From Seattle. Judy. Hi there. Hi, Jeff. Good to hey. see you and everyone else um, for a long time for this particular group for me yeah. uh, but somehow when i noticed it was about pets i felt like i had to come um i am a very happy and proud childless cat lady um <laughs> and i'm going to share with you a little bit <laughs> of um of three cats in my life, one in particular that just was on my my uh, <clears throat> lap and has now jumped off. Um, I'm going to tell you the last um, tale of my two previous cats that um, I had for 17 and a half years. I interviewed their both their parents, uh, for any of you that that know either uh, Iraj or Pari, Nam Iranian, um, <clears throat> um, they were born three houses down from them. And, um, and Pari knew that I just lost 
a previous CAD, actually, probably many months before, and said, hey, you know, there, these cats are born. So I went over and um, out came a very bouncy male. You know, they're like five, five weeks old or something. And he's like right in the front and sort of an in-your-face kitty. And there were four other cats that came out. And then there was a very shy little tuxedo girl kitty that came. And it was those two that I ended up adopting. And Thunderfoot was the name of the of the boy kitty because he had these loud, loud, who was the poet, uh, Robert Frost or something about fog comes in on cat's feet, but no, Thunderfoot had these big heavy feet um, and loud ones. And Wonder Bounce was the little girl because she would run out in the middle of the room and go straight up in the air like a helicopter and then run for to the other half. It really quite unusual. Um, but anyway, and I ended up calling her on a regular basis, Bouncy, rather than Wonder Bounce. So Thunderfoot and Bouncy. And they were the permanent residents of this little house I'm still in during what I call very um, belovedly my India years when I was uh, a part-time resident half the year um, for 15 years over at Maribod. And um, so they would get me for the half year that I was in the West and, and they'd get a professor on sabbatical, um, somebody they didn't know to take care of them the other half. Um, and they survived. Um, but when they passed away, they passed away within three weeks of one another. They were litter mates and had lived together for 17 and a half years. It was a huge loss to me. But the, the night after Thunderfoot was the second one to pass, and and so when he passed, it was like, ooh, ow, to my heart, because they brought so much love to my life from, from Baba through through the cats. And I went, I I was raised Protestant Christian originally. Um so but but it was it was Holy Week. It was um, you know the week be, be, just before Jesus was crucified, and um, in the Catholic Church, there's something that I never knew of before called timbre, and I was good friends with many of the best singers in all of Seattle, and they were they were performing at the big cathedral here that night, and I decided to go because um, for the beautiful music, but also my own sadness at their passing. And um, when, so Timbere, um, it is it's the Wednesday of Holy Week and it's, they, they observe the darkness. There were no lights in the whole cathedral so this is April of, um, of, oh, nine, I think, um, and, um, or, oh, 10, of, oh, 10, of 2010. And, um, so it was springtime, but it was, it was at night and, and there were, I think, seven candles that, one by one were blown out as um as the darkness as they did different places in the uh, the ceremony or whatever you know the singing and and program that they were doing um and then when the last candle was blown out it it was completely dark and I had, I had a vision sitting in that huge cathedral of my two kitties, Thunderfoot and Bouncy, 
were flying up. They had grown kitty wings and they were flying up to Baba on, on their little kitty wings. And they were both smiling really broadly and noticeably because they were so happy to be relieved of, I didn't know it till he passed away and then the vet um, said it had been cancer. And, um, and bouncy, I still don't know what it was, but they were really old and, and really ready to get a new coat. And it was such a comfort for my heart from Baba to let me see them in this, this beautiful kind of rainbow light going up to him. Um, and, you know, cause they'd, they'd held down my little fort here while I was over being able to be and take care of, of Baba's dear Vondeli and so forth um, in their final years. And so the segue, those were those two kitties. Today's actually an anniversary for me. Um, 29th of September in 2010, I had my first total knee replacement surgery. And it's really hard to recover from those guys. And uh, it hurts a lot. So they give you uh, opioid stuff, which I don't like, but the pain was bad enough that I took it, but I tried to get off of it. I got off of it a week early, which was five. So I was on it for five weeks, but I couldn't drive. And I was housebound or dependent upon somebody else or whatever for all that time. And so, um, and I had told myself ahead of time, Judy, you can't get another cat before you do these knee surgeries because you could trip over it and fall on the poor cat and then you know crush the cat and crush me and and so anyway the first day that I was free of the opioids I was able to drive and I went over to a friend's house I guess to deliver something and then I was driving away and all of a sudden I was free for it you know after a long you know, several weeks of dealing with being bed bound and house bound. And, and I hadn't planned on doing this, but I spontaneously went to um, the animal shelter thinking, I'll just do a reconnaissance. I'm just going to see and start thinking about getting a kitty. <laughs> and I, and I thought, Oh, I want a kitten. I, I, it was so nice when Thunderfoot and Bouncy were kittens. It was great to have them at that time. And I went in and looked at, as soon as I came in the door, there were a whole bunch of, of cat. Uh, it's a large, um, large shelter. Seattle's a big place. And um, anyway, there were lots of cats uh, just as I came in the door. But they wouldn't let you take them out and you had to call an attendant and and that person would take them out and hand them to you. And there was this one black and white tuxedo that reminded me very much of Bouncy. Um, and I asked to hold her. And the moment the person put this kitty into my, and she was nine months old at that time, not full grown, into my hands, she started purring louder than I'd ever heard any cat in the world purr. And it was, it was literally love at first touch for both of us. And, and, but, but I, the part of me that sort of, it's like, now Judy, Remember, you're not going to get a kitty today, but go look at the kittens, <laughs> you know, and that's what you came in for. And they were in a whole other part of the building and you could hang out with them in, in this big room and play with them and so forth. And I went and, but I didn't feel a connection with any of them. 
And I thought, okay, well, I was just going to come in and be. But then I remembered that little black and white kitty. I thought, well, let me just go take another look. And I went back near the front door and I looked up at the cage where, um, where the kitty had been and it was empty. And my heart just sank. It was like, oh no, I let go of that, that marvelous kitty that I had such a connection with. And it, I, I was so deflated. And then I looked around and I saw her and I'd made a mistake of which, which age she'd been in. And there she was, and it was like, I have to get her. I can't, I can't let somebody else get, I mean, if I, if I leave her even for an hour or somebody, anyway. And so I brought her home. She's, she's over there on her throne in the corner. Um, there she is um, in, the, in the corner. We'll keep her in the picture here, uh, under Baba's picture. Um, <clears throat> and she is the delight of my life. I've had cats all my life and they just keep getting better. This kitty, she hops up on my bed at the end of the evening when I'm ready to do pr prayers to Baba. And she does prayers with, to Mayor Baba with me every single night. It, she jumps up on her own accord or I can call kitty kitty and she'll you know she'll come running from wherever she is in the house to be there for prayers and RT just like anybody that's ever you know heard Nana Care say time for prayers and RT and you know and, and all of us keep you know flowing into Baba's Samadhi and so forth um but she's been such an incredible comfort and delight and um, and she it's that's her favorite time of the night, of all day, of any time, is doing Baba's prayers with me, and and it's like I, I so she's been you know now for years every single day she's heard the three prayers and I started doing it thinking it would be helpful for her, but I tell you it's such a joy for me. So I just, you know, when I saw it was about pets, it's like, I got to tell you about Ms. Whiskers is her, is wow. her name. Beautiful. Um, so, <clears throat> Thank anyway. you. Yeah, Judy. sorry. Wow. So, so long, but obviously I'm an enthusiastic <laughs> That's kid. how intimately they figure into our hearts. It's, um, it's beautiful. <clears throat> Let's hear from Denver. Wow. Well, Hey, yes. Good evening. I, um, my, my wife and I had two dogs and we moved them over to Western. They went to Western Colorado with us and lived there for a while and then back to the Denver metro area. And, um, just wonderful dogs, uh, uh, a stumpy tailed cattle dog, and then a, um, a Rottweiler shepherd mix. And, um, uh, they used to go for hikes with me in western Colorado up on the Cocopelli Trail. And, oh, we just go for miles and miles and miles. And they kept us both company and just just wonderful critters. And uh, when they both died within a couple of years of each other, uh, we didn't we didn't get another dog. My wife was uh, my wife had COPD and uh, she was on oxygen 24 seven. I was trying to keep the house extremely clean so that dust and you know with the the dander from the dogs and the fur and things blowing around uh, her lungs were in such bad shape that we decided we'd be best not to get another dog both of those dear dogs are buried in my backyard which is illegal but i don't give a damn that's where they belonged and that's where they are so um it's been, um, my wife has been gone now for three and a half years. And about three months ago, a friend of mine 
I, and it, it took me a while to, you know, I, I was just, it, it took me a while to get used to being here in this place alone uh, without, without my wife. And, but I was still feeling kind of alone. It was kind of strange walking back into this house. And a friend of mine who fosters dogs found this little terrier mix, weighs about 13 pounds, 10 years old. Her owners were having to be moved into an assisted living facility and couldn't take their dog with them. So I went to visit this little dog. She was being taken care of uh, in, in, in their old house by, um, by the son of these folks. And uh, this little dog jumped up in my lap and that was pretty much it. And uh, I, uh, she's just, uh, you know, she really filled a hole, really filled a hole in my, in my heart. Um, she loves to go for walks. Uh, we go for walks in the mornings and the evenings. And I have met neighbors that I've been in this neighborhood for years and I know most of the folks around here, but through this dog, I have met people that I've never met before. She loves to meet people. She loves to meet other dogs. We'll, uh, we were walking around about a week ago and there were, some, there were two people sitting on a porch and they had a little dog with them. And uh, my dog, Karis, uh, turned into their sidewalk and was going to walk up to the porch. And I said, now, now, wait a minute. You just can't wander up there. I said, she's friendly. Can she say hello to your dog? And they said, oh, yes, of course. Our dog's name is Jackie. And so the dogs met and we met and we introduced ourselves. And it was really <laughs> special. I mean, it's just lovely to me I, to meet people through you know this this wonderful little dog and she um i get up in the morning i make my coffee i sit in my favorite chair looking at my favorite picture of Meher baba and i read whatever baba book i'm reading at the time it's kind of my i don't know it's my morning time with baba if you will she will often jump up into my lap so we're both sitting there you know and i'm reading and i'm petting her and we're both looking at baba's picture that has become her favorite chair too so often well, I'm kind of busy doing things. I'll look around, and there she is in that chair, just kind of, it's, it's all good, you know. So, <laughs> <laughs> so it, and it's, um, it's, uh, it's really wonderful to have her here when, uh, you know, I need to be gone for a few hours, and I, I come home, and she, she, she greets me. I open the door, and she jumps down off the chair with the tail wagging, and then rolls over for a tummy rub and wanting a treat. And I'm, it, it's just, you know, it, it's a, it, it's a. It's such a trusting and accepting love that that these wonderful creatures give us. It's just, it's absolutely wonderful. She looks right into my eyes and um, I, it just, I, you know, I know you all know how special that is. They just, they just, they're so trusting. They trust us. They love us. And uh, I feel like, you know, I'm, I'm learning about love and trust from my little my little dog so and uh, she's uh, you know she helps me with anxiety and worry and the mind going nuts it's just oh wait a minute let's let's be together for a bit and we'll just sit here in the chair and look at Bob's picture and and it'll all be fine so, so. <laughs> beautiful so it's she uh, was really a gift from Bob it's, it's really lovely to have her here in my life so thank you, thank you. yeah fantastic Hey, and, and, and at the end, Bob, if you can get one of your poems, because some of your poems have your dog in them. If yeah, you can... I'll see if I can. Uh, oh, yeah. Is, is there a dog? Yeah, there's a dog one in our, in the Whistling Collection, Maryland, isn't there? Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll find it. Okay. Yeah. Megan? Hello, Megan? Marion. Why don't we just go on to Betty while we're, uh... Betty. You know, I, I, I wasn't planning to stay, but, but the topic, Brad, grab, uh, in fact, you scooped us. We have a late night scheduled on, on, on October 10th called Gone to the Dogs. And it's, uh, it's another, it'll be another night of uh, dog stories. Uh -huh. <laughs> But I'm sure there are enough dog stories in this in our community that uh, that that uh, 
they'll uh, both of these <laughs> meetings will be will be full and uh, full of love and great stories um i too have a dog like uh joe de sabatinos and tony's who who uh who lived with me and dave all of his life he's he's never been alone until dave passed and he just can't be alone <laughs> he, he I, I he again yeah you know, he scratches on the windows and on the doors and wants to so uh i have a neighbor thank god who uh who will babysit him when she's around but a lot of times i just have to take him with and including to work and uh, so i i do caregiving for a little old lady who also loves animals so she understands um but uh, it was uh reassuring to me to know other people have a problem with dogs who just will not be alone don't want to be so um i think that I'll, I'll leave it at that because i i'll save a story for for thursday after next when we tell we have our dog night <laughs> okay okay going to the dogs <laughs> no. uh, bingo Hey, Dinku, they are in... Jay Baba, everyone. Yeah. Uh, dogs have somehow always appeared in my life at the right time. <clears throat> Sorry, I've got a bit of a sore throat. <clears> throat> um, I thought I'd read this that I once got, and it's very apt. <clears throat> Animals choose to come into our lives. They are part of our karma and we are part of theirs. Sometimes they are found abandoned or wandering in the middle of the road or in danger in the heart in the heart of the night. Other times they are found at the front door of the house as if sent by fate and other times they arrive from loved ones, neighbors or strangers. Animals are, were already in our karma, at least, in this life as in others. According to Brian Rice... Oh, 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 oh. Hey, that's Ralph, I think. Oh, Go ahead, keep going, yeah. Okay. Animals were already in our karma, at least, in this life as in others. According to Brian Weiss, the same animal often incarnates itself several times during our lifetime, simply changing shape and coat and being recognized by small gestures, details, and subtle habits. This is clearly seen with cats. When a new animal enters our house and knows exactly where to go, it's a sign that it, sim it simply says, I'm back. Many people at the moment of death receive the soothing vision not of a deceased relative, but rather of an animal. This means a lot, because for our soul, there is no difference between one species and another. Animals are in our evolutionary path, just like we are in theirs. For this reason, we must respect them as sacred creatures and take the greatest care of them. They are part of us and in a different form of the universe. This was written by Lionel Dupont. And mm. I thought it was so apt because this is what happened to me with a couple of my previous dogs and the one that's with me now. Yeah. I mean, they turn up and they've got something of my previous dog in them some some trait or you know they just i can't explain it but it's very true yeah you've uh you right you and rocky had a wonderful relationship yeah i and with my other ones as well but this one the one i've got now he's actually a well, he's kind of like a stray, but Rocky passed in December last year, and I was really heartbroken, and I kept 
praying and saying, why did you have to leave? I wish you could come back. And three months later, this dog, an absolutely unknown dog, turns up in my building on the first floor. And he'd come every evening, sit there, and we'd pet him, keep some food or water outside for him. This was around the beginning of April. Mid-April, my husband left for the U.S. And two days after he left, I was coming home. I And he was sitting there. I petted him. He just got up and went up the stairs. I'm on the floor above. He just went up the stairs and sat by my door. And as soon as I opened the door, he walked in like he knew exactly where to go. And went and sat down by my bed, exactly like Rocky used to do. And he stayed there the night. In the morning, he'd get up and go. And this is this is what he's been doing ever since then. But he's such a mild, sweet, friendly dog. It's it's really amazing. It's like, and I always feel that Baba sent him to me to give me company and comfort. Beautiful. Yeah, I mean, they really enter deeply into our hearts, you know. It's, it's, it doesn't have to be just human beings all the time, <laughs> you know. They have such unconditional love. Okay. Dan? And Luna? Yeah. And we have two dogs. Taj is usually the one that's sitting behind us. Um, always wanting to get into the Zoom capture. I think this is so funny because anybody that is as wacko as we are as dog lovers or animal lovers, it's all going, it's being recorded, guys. So <laughs> let, let I just love how honest everybody is. Um, this is Luna who who is turning, I think, uh, 14. 14 this year. And um, she she has human eyes and communic Jeff got to hang with her. She's able to communicate without an alphabet board or without, you know, it's all with her eyes. And until you get it right, she'll she'll just keep looking at you deeper and deeper and deeper. <laughs> so the thing that we're dealing with, I think that, you know, all of us who have had pets have had to say goodbye to pets and we've always had our eyes set on bringing in a a new generation and since terry and i've been together 36 years i think we've had three or four generations but we're actually talking about maybe taking a break and it is one of the hardest conversations to have because we're both retired now you know, Rick lets me know that he's away for a month or two. We, you know, going away for a week like we're doing next week. We've got to get dog care, and it's it's a lot of work. It's a the attachment is deep, and um, and you have to be present and make sure you know your dogs are taken care of. And so it's really hard to think. I know. Oh. Um, <laughs> that we might come home to a house that might be empty. And it's hard enough, like when I take them to the groomers and I come back and it's like two hours of quietness, they could be sleeping for two hours and not make a sound and I wouldn't think about it, but knowing they're not here, it's like a piece of my heart is being tugged away. So I'll let other people get uh, get honest and authentic and chip <laughs> up. Beautiful, Diane. Really, those are sweethearts. What a, they're non yeah, residents. Yeah. Gabriela? Hey, uh -huh. Thank you guys. A beautiful, beautiful sharing. Um, of course, I want to tell you about every pet I've ever had because everyone has such a, vibrant and amazing story um but I'll tell you my most uh, Baba has always worked with me through animals um and shown me how he's there and he's in charge with me 
So I'll tell you my little miracle story. This was big one for me when I tell my Baba stories. So um, Bao had named my last two cats, Niru and Piru. And when Niru died, um, Piru and I were very lonely. And we knew, I knew Piru needed a, a, needed a friend. But I kept saying to Baba, you know, you have to tell me when to go and where to go because I know myself. And if I go to any shelter, I'll just take a cat and it might be the wrong one. So please let me know. So months go by. I mean, probably five, six months go by. And finally, one day, it's um, the day before Veterans Day. It was a Monday. And I was at the post office. It's like close to five in the afternoon. I was just rushing to get something to the, and I get a message from Baba saying, now go to the shelter. And I'm like, oh, okay, Baba, but it's Monday. It's almost five. You know, the shelter is going to close. And, and, and I hear Baba go, okay, wait for Wednesday. This is Monday. Tuesday would be Veterans Day likely to be closed. Right. So Baba's saying, wait for Wednesday. So, um, Okay, I get in my car, I, I mail my letter, I get in my car, and my car drives to the shelter. Okay, so I was planning to obey Baba and wait for Wednesday, but I didn't. I, I didn't mean to, the car ends up at the shelter. So uh, the shelter, it turns out, had moved. Now, by now, it's like 520 or something like that, and I go, oh, yes, I know where that uh, new location is. And, you know, and I'll, I just go home now and I'll go back on Wednesday. So then I get in the car and it drives to the second shelter, the, the, the new place. Okay. All right. <laughs> now I'm there and I see the door is slightly open, you know, and it's like, the, now it's 10 to six. It's Monday. And, you know, I, I knew I wasn't really listening, whatever, but I, you know, I, the car drove there. So, so then I go out into the place and it's empty Every, they're all going home you know there's no one around so i wait around for a little bit and finally somebody comes out and i said you know i'd like to see your your kittens and and they said you know we're about to close uh, sorry then they looked at me in the wheelchair and they say well it was probably hard for you to get here come in and see so i i go in it was very you know use the situation as best you can so there i was i i go in and uh there's not very many kittens there were maybe two or three there was a brother and sister and they were playing together and they were real sweet and you know i said oh yeah let me see these kittens these two kittens so um i knew i could only have one but let me just so i held the boy and he was very rambunctious and i knew there's nothing i could do to and I hold the girl, little black little bundle of fur, and she looks up at me and starts purring, as in the earlier story, starts purring, and I see Baba's eyes. I see the cats. I see Baba's love coming through the kitty's eyes. I'm like, okay, oh, this is it. This is my cat. This is my cat. You know, I know this is my cat. And I was really uh, excited, and I started to tell them, um, I'll, I'll take this one. Um, and they said, okay, well, you know, uh, I, we can't give it to you tonight. It's too late, but you could come back tomorrow. So apparently they were open on Tuesday. And then all of a sudden I remembered that, uh, Bob had said to come back on Wednesday to, to wait for Wednesday. And I really had, um, I had disobeyed him. That's what went through my mind. You know, the moment of doubt. And so I said, so, well, hold on. Maybe I might not be able to come tomorrow. And what, can you give me the name of this kitten so that I could come? Because they always give them names like, you know, Bouncy and Flouncy and this and that um, it, to, so that you can identify them. And so uh, if you give me the name of this cat, I'll decide and I'll come back if I want it. So they go to the thing and they look, 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 and they go, cat's name is Wednesday. Oh, <laughs> uh, no joke, no joke. And I just, I, you know, Baba, this cat is now with me still. I love this cat very, very much. And um, she's just as loving as can be most, you know, and there's one other, I've got another. Wait, kid. before you go on, did yeah. you 
come back and get Wednesday on Tuesday. Oh no, yeah, Wednesday. Tuesday. I got Wednesday on Tuesday. I got Beautiful. Wednesday on Tuesday as soon as I could get her because then I knew <laughs> that's the, that was the, that was Baba's way of joking around with me. And you know, sometimes I always felt like I'm a person that needs proof that Baba is really there, and um, this was one of his examples of showing me that even though he's not in a body, he can guide my life. So. Lovely story, Gabriel. <laughs> Gabriel. Wow. And of course, we, we call her Wednesday. We couldn't have changed her name. Yeah. Her name is, is always Wednesday forever. Yeah. <laughs> Emmy? Now from Florida. Emmy? She's Hi. Making... Hey, good. Uh, <laughs> uh, the story about the Wednesday, Anthony might have to help me with this one. Isn't it reminded me of the story of like, uh, wasn't there something with the World War where it was like the cat in the rain or something? Oh yeah, yeah, <clears throat> yeah. That w was interesting. <clears throat> I'll just say it briefly, but uh, this is back in you know, uh, you know, in the mid forties. <clears throat> and uh, that we're at Marizade and, and Baba asked Margaret Krask to, uh, to put out the cat, but it was raining cats and dogs, so to speak, and she demurred, you know, no, Baba, it's raining and everything, and so he held off on that. <clears throat> and, uh, but then the next day he asked, <clears throat> and uh, she again, it was raining, it was monsoon, and <laughs> So uh, she, uh, you know, hesitated again, and Baba said, whose cat is it? You know, so she put it out, and, you know, the cat, she said, just went under an eave, so it wasn't like throwing a cat right out under the pouring rain. So Margaret always felt that, you know, that simultaneously was this, the Normandy invasion, you know, coming into France, <clears throat> And it was delayed one day. The weather wasn't, pro you know, uh, proper. And then the next day, the invasion began, which was really the beginning of the end of World War II. So Margaret used to say this, you know, and share that. She kind of felt there was a link. Then 50 years later, one of her dancers, uh, Viola Farber, was happened to be in France when they were commemorating the 50th anniversary of the Normandy invasion. And this general gets up there and he's talking about it, all of that. And then he says they had a code word. See, the, the Germans were on the coast and then the, uh, the French resistance was behind trying to get a message of when to make the, the invasion. And the code was, has the, uh, the violists listen to this, but the, um, the, the, the code was, has the cat been let out? So it, it, it was the very code is what Bob was doing there at Marizat. And, yeah. uh, and, and to say the cat has been let out, that means that's Jeff, the green light. Yeah. Um, I, as I heard it, um, from, um, I think from Tex Hightower, um, that the, the code name was throw out the cat, was uh -huh. throw out the cat, which was exactly okay. what I was asking um, Margaret to do. Okay, throw out the cat, but that was the, gave the green light to the exactly. Normandy invasion. So how incredible, but go ahead, Emmy, I just... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> that story just really reminded me of that the Wednesday story and yeah um so everybody this is Fozzy come here buddy come here <laughs> um so Fozzy well first of all the story really start well this is Fozzy <laughs> and um so the story of Fozzy starts with Flowey which was my beloved cat for 17 years. And I loved Flowey so, so, so much beyond words. And um, after she, I saw her be born. And uh, after she passed, I wanted to get another kitten, wanted to get another cat. 
And Anthony had grown up with dogs his whole life. And I had grown up with cats my whole life. So I wanted to get a cat and he wanted to get a dog. So I don't know if this was years, but it was definitely months, at least like a year of us going back and forth about like, oh, we should get a dog. Oh, we should get a cat. Oh, we should get a dog. <laughs> and <laughs> um, and um, I had never taken care of a dog before, so I didn't really know how to take care of a dog. And I didn't know if... Um, I just didn't know how I was. I actually, one of the reasons I didn't want to get a dog is because it's so devastating. The grief is so unfathomably, inconceivably, agonizingly horrific. I knew it would be that way. And I was, it was that way with my cat. And I knew it would be even more unbearable with a dog. And so I, I, that's one of the reasons I was really resistant. So this circles back to Meher Baba because um, on Amartiti, uh, during the, um, like 2021, 2021, um, Amartiti, um, Anthony showed me this video and I don't exactly remember what video it was, but it was something about, um, there was just, people were just so devastated that, um, it might've been Mara. It was some, some story where people were just so the Mondale, everybody was so distraught about Baba not being in his body. I know people, you know, I know that there's all kinds of connections beyond the body, but it was particularly about the grief. And I had this realization, I don't know how it hit me. And I was sobbing watching this video that Anthony showed me. And I had this realization that when Anthony dies, whether that's 50 years from now, 30 years from now, five minutes from now, like at some point, Anthony's going to die. And I had this vision of being at his like f memorial and thinking to myself that the biggest regret of my entire life is that I didn't let him get a dog, like that I didn't let us get a dog. Like I, it was somehow I had this realization. I could start crying right now. It was this realization of like, if I don't allow this dog into our life, I, that will be my biggest regret of my life. And um, so I don't know how it happened within like a couple days of me. So I realized that on the Amartiti and I told him that day, I said, I actually completely surrender and we'll get a dog. <laughs> and, <laughs> and so um, apparently Fozzie was born within two days of the Amartiti. And his mom, Anthony's mom, like called us and was like, oh, guess what? There's like this golden retriever that needs a home and we're going to get his sister. And so we'll have like two family members from the same. Anyways, it's just been the most life changing uh, experience to have Fozzie. And I've just really resonated so much with what people have said during this um, Zoom tonight about how animals just enter deeply into our hearts with unconditional love and deep trust and the intimacy of the love with our animals and the eyes communicating without an alphabet board. <laughs> um, just how, how deep the, the, the familiarity is it's, it's beyond this world. So, and the, the vibrancy and the. <sighs> yeah. So. Yeah, beautiful. There's a, 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 a line from Queen Elizabeth where she says, grief is the price we pay for having love deeply. You know, grief is the price we all have to pay for having loved deeply. Beautiful. You know, I mean, it, it's, yeah. Okay, thank you. That's great. That was beautiful. <laughs> Yes. Okay, Jay Baba, everyone. Um, everyone associates me with Kippy, which is my current dog, but I'm going to talk about previous dogs. Um, my grandparent is Kippy, of course, DVDs in here. <laughs> Kippy, of course, is a Boston Terrier. Um, but um, my grandparents had Boston Terriers. So the dogs that I grew up with were my grandparents' dogs and each of them was named Spunky. <laughs> so when one dog came and the other dog left, it was just Spunky, um, which seems to me just 
hilarious um, and and fun about dogs. Um, I came to Baba in my therapist's office, Stephen Gage. Um, I asked him about the universe. I'd been seeing him about a year and he told me about Baba and it took me back to being in college when I had a roommate um, that had a Baba card, a don't worry, be happy card on the um, door frame. And I knew exactly who Baba was, but um, I had not been attracted to um, Baba at that time, but it sat in my ear for, I don't know, 30 years or something. Um, and so when I came to Baba, it was before Thanksgiving one year. And um, one of the first, I mean, I did several things. One is I went to Gil and Chitra Alvarado's house. Someone told me um, uh, about that. And so I, um, I did that. But I think the first real Baba decision I made was to get a dog because I had not believed in reincarnation. And I had one child still at home and uh, one child that had just gone off to college, two boys. And um, I got a dog named Buster. And I looked at the Boston Terrier rescue and I got a rescue dog. It was a Boston Terrier. So it checked all of my boxes as yes, you get a rescue. Um, yes, you get a Boston Terrier. And I don't know, he was, I don't know, nine or 10 or eight or something. But um, Buster had been severely um, abused. And um, so I could tell certain, there were tell, certain tells, like he was afraid of boys with hoodies. He was afraid of panel trucks. He was afraid of older women that smoked. Um, and mm -hmm. other than that, any other kind of description of anybody didn't matter. You know, that was kind of who he was afraid of. And one day we were walking and we were, there was a fence between us and the next door neighbor's house. And this giant dog, I could see through the fence. Um, it was sort of a basket weave fence was just barking like crazy. And I realized Buster doesn't hear that. Buster is not just calm. Buster is not dealing with that at all. Because I would realize, oh, Buster must have been in a neighborhood because he's not, you know, worried about um, uh, mo um, grass mowers and lawn mowers and stuff. And so I had, you know, a couple of things that I just I had explained away. So I went home and Buster was in the kitchen and I dropped two uh, saucepans and Buster didn't turn around. And I realized Buster's deaf. Buster's not just calm. Buster is deaf. And I came across Buster because y'all know my email is gailnitz.com at gmail.com. Um, I had been to a knitting event and um, some friends of mine were selling um, handmade articles. And this woman um, approached me about a Boston, she, she was fostering this Boston Terrier dog. And I don't know, it just, it was my first Baba decision of, oh, I should get this Boston Terrier dog because I believe in reincarnation now. So I did. And Buster was really a delight. Um, my uh, younger son trained him, I realize now um, in retrospect, which is why I had such a well-trained <laughs> dog and I don't now. But um, I just wanted to tell you about Buster. Um, who was 36 pounds, Kippy is 16 pounds. But I would very often, I would take walks at night and have to walk Buster back home carrying all 36 pounds because Buster would be afraid of people and bark and you know, people would walk up and be friendly. Um, so I guess that's just my story of my um, Baba and dog coming together um, and the fact that my grandparents had Boston Terriers. My dad 
came home when I was maybe four years old. Um, he'd been on a long business trip, like through six weeks or something. And he came home at Christmas time with a Boston Terrier puppy. So we had a Boston Terrier puppy as a child. And then that dog got hit by the mailman in our yard which I think there was some drinking involved. It was back when, uh, not mailman, milkman. Back when you, we had milkman. Um, and so uh, the milkman ran over our dog. So I, I just picked up the connection. And of course, now I'm not going to tell you the Kippy story, but you know, knowing that Elizabeth had Kippy has been very, very meaningful to me. Kippy's 16 pounds and she's just the light the light of my life. And um, she's just such a sweetheart. Um, and just briefly about Kippy, when um, I went to a dog trainer's, they suggested that we leave her in a crate for two uh, for two years without any um, kind of bedding or anything, you know, any blankets or anything. And I thought, Baba wouldn't like that. I mean, I'd not, I've been a Baba lover two months or something. I thought Baba wouldn't like that. Baba would not, you know, Baba loved, at that point I'd read enough to know that Baba loved dogs. And um, I thought, I'm not doing what these, this person says, you know, we're stopping now. Her approach to dog loving does not match with what I know about Baba. And I was so new in Baba, but I was, um, so knowledgeable at that point I'd been reading like crazy um about how much Baba loved animals and I it just helped me decide um how I was going to do things and I was going to do things the Baba way J Baba yeah hey before we go on uh, uh Dinku this is Dinku's new dog I don't know if you can see it yeah can you see, can you get yeah. that on like well um, there it is now that dog, believe it or not, is in her refrigerator. Yes. <laughs> Can you imagine? <laughs> yes, yes. I mean, like, yes. wow, just make yourself at home. <laughs> Why? Why is he in the refrigerator? <laughs> I don't know. I, uh, <laughs> I don't see it. The, the thing is, he's, he's petrified of loud noises. And this was during the Ganesh festival when the processions go down the road. And they have loudspeakers and these big drums and they burst crackers. He, he gets so petrified. He shaves, uh, he shakes, you know, worse than a leaf in the wind. So he was sticking to me and, uh, I opened the refrigerator just a little bit to take my dinner out. And the next thing I knew is he pushed his way in and got inside. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, I was in shock for a couple of seconds. I didn't know what to do. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. And he just wouldn't come out. So finally, I switched off all the kitchen lights. And he still didn't come out because the refrigerator light was on. Then I ah. switched the refrigerator off. And finally, he came out. But um, <laughs> oh, <he's... laughs> that, that was really something. I've never experienced it. Isn't that great? That's just the best. You know, make yourself at home, but not quite that much at home, right? <laughs> hey, so we I think it's kind of late, so we'll have, let's have just one more uh, check-in because it's, um, <clears throat> and then uh, like uh, Betty said, there's a, a another thing devoted to pets, to dogs that's coming up in the weeks to come. Rich. This one's really short because if I started talking about a dog story, I, I, I do, uh, uh, you know, that whole 10 minutes. So here it is. This is a poem I wrote. Um, and it occurred as part of my grief about my dog, Monty, who died last year. But Adi and I were sitting in the backyard. So I was writing poems to Baba. So this is called Adi number five. Very brief. Such friendship, how is it contained in a coat of fur? Two big eyes presiding over two beautiful nostrils. How can the wag of that 
fifth member, the tail, sings such friendliness. It's a courtship of love and bonding, all for that precious flood of love. And Baba, how did you find your way into this mix? Oh, Baba, uh, ev oh, Baba, ever your friend, Hafiz, would forever love Adi. But me, a mere mortal, I can barely hang with you big dogs. Right. Beautiful, Rich. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Wonderful. <clears throat> Jeff, yeah. can, I, can I just mention that story about the cat in the rain appears in Tony Zoyce's May Her Baba Travels. If you look up Dwight D. Eisenhower, uh, th that story appears under Eisenhower. <clears throat> and even, even the part with Viola uh, Farber in there, too? Well, not Viola, no, but that code word is in there. The, the yeah. Code, yeah. Yeah, that, that was uh, 50 years later that she was stunned right. to hear that, yeah. Let's see, so I think it's, it's kind of a little bit late. <clears throat> Ralph, is, is yours long or short? There are five people waiting. Mine is pretty short. I'll make it quick. <laughs> okay. Um, and it goes back to the first dog uh, story was from Joe the Sabatino about a greyhound. And this was a greyhound. I was probably about 19 years old, trying to go to college in Waco, Texas. And um, I was driving my car from, I don't know where I was coming from, but going to my apartment and along a road that ran along the shore but above the the uh, lake and um and it was countryside off away from the lake it was countryside and uh i passed a dog it was and i said that was a greyhound and i said what's it doing here and i saw that the dog was lost so i went back and the dog got in the car with me and I took off. I took it home with me and I fed it and wondered what was happening. You know, I don't, it had no collar and I thought how peculiar. So I kept this dog and this, it was getting along fine. And this was an ups over the garage, garage apartment. There's just stairs that went up and the apartment was on top of a of a garage for an automobile. Small apartment. And um uh, went to bed and school was, uh, was time for school the next morning. Well, I had this alarm clock that really went like like that. It was actually had two little bells and a, and a tiny hammer, you know, old timey clock, alarm clock. I had the alarm clock set to get up and go to class. And so the alarm clock went off, but all I knew was chaos. I, I, I opened my eyes to chaos. The dog was going berserk and jumping all over the running nearly running up on the ceiling and the walls and and she was it was a female she lost and she was losing her bowels everywhere all over everything i said oh my goodness and i said what was the problem well, i got i turned the alarm clock off and she settled down well, i went to class and we got through that day okay. Next day, same thing happened in the morning. She went nuts. And I kind of started two and two together that she was responding to the alarm clock. But I couldn't imagine why it wasn't that dramatic a sound. I went to class. I left her in the apartment. I think... I can't, this has been a long time ago. So anyway, I went to class, I came back, 
and she is nowhere to be found. I couldn't find her. So I drove around the neighborhood and there was an elementary school and the children were out at recess playing. And I asked the kids if they'd seen this dog, a dog. And they said, yes. And she said, the teacher called the print. She was out here playing with us. And the teacher called the principal. So we're, and so I spoke to the teacher, she said, yes, the principal called the Humane Society and they came and got her. And I think she must be at the dog pound. So I said, oh, wow, okay. So I went to the dog pound and sure enough, there she was. Well, I decided, I, what, I, I said, I can't care for this dog. I mean, it's not working out. And I thought, and I thought, and I thought. And the next morning came, same thing to the alarm clock. And I thought, my papa and my mama, my maternal grandparents have a farm. And I drove her out to the farm. And uh, I said, Papa, will you please take this dog? She's no good for the city life. I can't keep her. She doesn't like to be cooped up. And he said, and he agreed to take her. So he did. And that was the end of, and I, I don't know how that worked out actually in time, over time, because but um, so, but then years later, I met these people who were into greyhound racing. They bred and raced greyhounds. And I told them this story. They said, don't you know what that was, Ralph? That's the sound that goes off when the dogs start the race. That It goes ding like that. And they that sound... Then those doors open and the dogs come out of there like shot out of a cannon, you know, going full blast to run the race. And I said, she said she was responding to that because she was trying to give it all she had when she heard that sound. Wow. <laughs> Very I good. That was amusing. Yeah. Say Bob. <laughs> yeah. Hey, I think. Uh, the rest of you, I mean, if you could just save your stories because uh, it is kind of late. And um, I thought we would end with Bob. Uh, did you find a, a, a one of your dog poems? Your I did, yeah. The uh, in, in, in our book, Whistling Past the Tavern, there's a poem titled Walking the Dog. And it's actually uh, written uh, uh, about... Or, or with the idea came, I used to walk Richard Sanders' dog when he was working. And uh, I would walk his dog when my wife and I lived in Fruta, Colorado, and I would I would walk his dog all over the place over there. And so it's his, he, he was quite a, quite a good dog. But, um, walking the dog. Short lead or long makes no difference. He is always at the bitter end, straining after the next bird or squirrel or trace of those who passed before. If I try to change the route, or simply slow down to consider, to meet these moments on my terms, he jerks me straight, holds me back to his pressing needs. I'm mostly patient with him. He makes my arms strong, and reminds me how the mind works, how the ravenous dogs of desire, worry, anger, and fear drag me across the rough edges of the world, no matter how I wish to sit or set my course or set my heart. So, Beautiful. Jay <laughs> Baba. Yeah. <laughs> he hey, let's have a really few. Excuse oh. me. Can I just make one real brief yeah. announcement? Yeah, um, go ahead. I've been, asked, I've been asked to participate in the mayor's CPUS site it's a baba site that involves people in the west coast east coast iran india uh to tell my baba story with a focus on the un uh, on october 5th so it's m-e-h-e-r-s-e-p-a-s -E -E you'll see i think she's advertised it on baba sites and it's on facebook and it'll be a friday and then you can 
look up that site afterwards and just like Baba Zoom, the video will be posted. I have no idea what I'm going to say, but I'm cramming to get all my stories written yeah. up. So, yeah. And can you put that in the chat? Any of the information or? Um, um, I'm not sure. Well, I can put okay. the name of the uh, Mayor Sipas and you can look that up, I suppose. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's have a few moments of silence and before we go on, okay? Mm. Jay Baba, that was wonderful to hear these lovely stories. And, uh, you know, we can do do it some other time, but uh, as Betty said, this, something is coming up a little later on, too, <clears throat> if you attend yeah. that. It's <laughs> October 10th at 7 p.m. Eastern Time. Okay. What day of the week? It's a, oh, Betty, um, I think it's a Thursday. Yeah, Thursday. Okay. It's a Thursday because our kid is getting married on 1010. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, beautiful. Thanks for all the very touching, lovely stories. Really. <laughs> Thank you, Jim. Hey, and, the, yeah. the, and I'm sure there are many more <clears throat> uh, that could be shared. Yeah. All yeah. right. Jay Baba, everybody. Yeah. Hey, Jay Jaya, Baba, Jaya, Jaya nice you. to see Baba. you. Jaya, are you all the hey, way yeah. in Hyderabad? No, I'm in New Jersey with Shilpa. And, uh, oh, okay. <laughs> Narayan and Shilpa. Yeah. Jay Baba. Good. Jay Baba. I came here. Okay. Jay Baba. Yeah. And do we have Nasreen? Oh. Nasreen is lost. <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay. Where is she? She's Nasreen. in the corner. She's in the corner. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Okay, Avatar, Meher, Baba, Chiche. Avatar, Meher, Baba, Chiche. Avatar, Meher, Baba, Chiche. Thank you, Jeff. Thank, Thank you. you. Jeff. Thank you, all of you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Jeff, are you going to India soon? Yeah. Yeah. I, if uh, everything works out on the 9th of October. Oh, we're going to miss you. But a goer moped uh, is I'm going to. Oh, we're going to. We're going to come to Merdale Beach on the sixth of October. Oh, so we're wow. going to see you. We're going to see you. Yeah. Okay. Good. I'll catch you when you get here. Yes. Yeah. yeah and I'll I'll be coming back on around the I think the twenty third of November. Oh. <laughs> so. <clears throat> long trip. Yeah. I uh, yeah, a little longer than usual, but um, uh -huh. I'm, I'm I'm hoping it'll be a little bit of a sabbatical, you know. Yeah, we'll be there yeah. from November eleventh. What's Hyderabad. that? We'll be there at November from November eleventh. Eleventh, you'll be. At, oh, but not Marabad though. Hyderabad. Yeah. Not Marabad. If you happen to be at Hyderabad, please visit us. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, okay. <laughs> all right. Much okay. love, all of you. Thank you. Have a nice Thank week. Thank you. You too, Jeff. Thank